Good morning, everyone. I'm Tarek, uh, CEO at uh, McAlvin's. I'm joined today by not Ant and Deck, but uh, equally entertaining uh, Ant and Rashmi. Ant is the founder and head of uh, an extremely innov innovative online learning and development company called Try Digital Learning. Rashmi, our COO, uh, seasoned accountant and uh, outsourcing for both small and larger international companies. Um, it's held various leadership roles and he uh, will be on the panel with me also. Uh, we're going to talk about pivoting your business. No doubt many of you, like, uh, like myself, uh, have been pivoting our personal lives over the past four or five months. Um, more about that later though. Um, we want this to be a very interactive webinar and uh, ask our panelists to, uh, to take questions throughout the webinar, so please use the Q&A um, tab that you have at the bottom of your screen somewhere. I'm not quite sure where it will be. I think you click on the three dots and, uh, and something will, will pop up and help you with that. Um, first, some facts and figures though, resulting from uh, the past four or five months of uh, this pandemic that we find ourselves in. Uh, we do hope to, at some point to get off the subject of COVID, but I think it's gonna be with us for, uh, for certainly the next uh, uh, months, uh, next 12 months. So uh, it will impact how we run our businesses and how we run our personal lives. Uh, so facts and figures. Um, Joe, if you wouldn't mind getting on to the next slide. Uh, many of you will know 50% of UK businesses uh, make up um, the UK's revenue um, and employing some 44% of uh, the UK workforce. At the start of 2019, total uh, employment in SMEs was 16.6 .6 million. There's talk of that possibly being impacted by as much as 25% of the workforce uh, becoming uh, unemployed. Uh, 80% of SMEs uh, say their revenues are in decline. Uh, one in four are at risk of defaulting on their loans. And 24% believe that uh, they will be making staff redundant, if not already, but over the coming, the coming months and 36% uh, of growth projects on hold. I mean, obviously all of these things will impact the general growth of the economy, but, but equally so, more so, uh, us getting out of the, uh, the troubles that we currently are experiencing. So what is pivoting? Um, pivoting is uh, over to you, Rashmi. So uh, Rashmi is gonna tell us more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope, I hope everybody's well. You're probably thinking, why on earth is this guy coming on wearing a mask? Uh, I'll tell you why. So let me take the mask off now. So pivoting, in terms of explaining pivot, I thought I'd start with, as Tariq mentioned, personal pivot. Um, as a result of this pandemic, our lifestyle has changed. Um, First, for the short term, we are all, um, we're all protecting our lives to make sure that we, we do not get the uh, virus. And if we do get the virus, first recover from it, short term, long term, make sure we do not catch it and we do not pass it to anybody else. So we take certain actions to, uh, to, to make sure that we don't, and hence the mask. One of the pivot, personal pivots, which we are, as a lifestyle change, managing now is wearing masks, social distancing, so on and so forth. So that's personal pivot, changing our lifestyle as a result of a condition, a catastrophe, something that has happened in the world or in the country, wherever it may be. Business pivoting, same thing. It's um, a shift in new strategy a business takes, sometimes wholesale change, sometimes just a minor change to address a particular problem. In other words, pivoting is changing your business model to help recover from uh, a particular tough period, surviving and experiencing new competition, or factors that make the original business model unsustainable. And with this particular pandemic, we're going to be talking, giving examples of how people have, uh, beg your pardon, how businesses have pivoted as a result of this global pandemic global businesses um, pivoting for sustainability, basically, sustaining their business. So that, in a nutshell, is pivoting. 
and it's not new. It's a buzzword that's come about as a result post COVID. But in terms of businesses, corporates that I've been involved with, the panelists have been involved with, and you've been involved with, entrepreneurs are always looking at their business, looking at outside factors affecting their business and changing direction to to meet those uh, you know the hurdles that they come across no business goes in a straight line in a nutshell that's business pivoting business pivoting uh, is has two phases firstly it's the survival phase and the second phase is the thrive phase survival phase short term i.e had i caught coronavirus and i did catch coronavirus my survival phase was to get better and get back to normal normality. Likewise, with this pandemic, businesses are getting back first and foremost, survive, and then you, you adjust to the conditions that are around you to then thrive because businesses are there for growth. So pivoting, it's a buzzword post COVID. However, it's not new. Okay. Next slide. When is it time to pivot? Some casing examples here. Time to pivot is, as, as I explained, when there is a sudden um, change to your market conditions, your economy, that is significantly affecting the way you conduct business. COVID-19, we'll be talking more about it, more or less, uh, on this webinar on this. But there are other times when you would also pivot. And the next four points here, company always playing catch up, there's too, many, too much competition, financial difficulty, high turnover of staff and customers, is not the conditional change, they're a symptom. So a particular factor has affected um, your business, i.e. Something, something has taken place in the economy, uh, could be external factors, could be internal factors, which has meant that your turnover of staff you're losing customers, you're losing staff. Obviously, if you lose customers, you're gonna be in financial difficulty. You may be losing customers because there's too much competition. You're always playing catch up. So one triggers the other. It's, these are not the reasons, these are the symptoms. The condition is what the business would focus on in terms of then steering towards, uh, yeah, making changes to the business plan strategy to then, uh, address these symptoms and not all conditions are bad there are businesses out there they start with two or three products but what they find is one product has got the has got the most traction in in which case sorry I'm just can i just in which case then you just focus on that one particular product and uh, the business would focus on that there is no point wasting time and energy on products or services which are not yielding the best results and the best profit. If one product is, then go with that. Or if your outlook has changed, once again, you would be uh, changing course of direction. As mentioned before, pivoting is not new. Businesses are already doing it. You must already be doing it. Okay, next slide, please. So now we're gonna focus on the global pandemic that uh, has resulted in, I mean, all businesses, large, small, um, having, to, having to cope with it and to pivot their business short term and long term to, to address the situation. The two levels, please, next slide. Next slide, please. So as I explained, there's the immediate damage limitation um, changes that a business has to make. And these are basically looking at your financials, looking at your cash flow. Uh, when you mean when I say cash flow, uh, I mean looking at your debtors, looking at your invoicing suppliers, and making sure that that is robust. You understand your customers. You understand that they're paying. Just cash is king at a time of need. Cash is king. So managing your cash flow when there is a severe situation like what we're facing now. That's what businesses are doing. Cutting overheads is the next thing because you cut overheads, you, you, you streamline your business so that you're focusing on, it's, it's basically focusing on uh, survival. Cut your overheads, cut your 
spend which is not required and, uh, and, and then look at the longer term picture. The thing that when, when, uh, when uh, within this uh, COVID, in, uh, COVID impact, the drastic change that we've had, <clears throat> one of the things that businesses should be looking at is external support. And this external support that we receive from the government has played a key role in businesses coping with the impact of COVID. So the furlough scheme, the loans, the business rates that they're giving rebates on, the restaurants now, the 50% um, you know, uh, discounts that they're giving Monday to Wednesday, that's all in support of businesses to ensure that they survive, they survive this particular patch, the, the turbulence that we are facing, so that once the survival mode is passed, they're able to res, you know, resist that, then they can, uh, they, then their business will become business as usual anyway. I think, and, Rashmi, just a point, sorry, a point just worth noting there is that we've got a, a vast area that we've set up on our, uh, on our website, which actually provides a lot of um, information around these schemes that are available uh, to people, and a lot of them are still open as well. So um, in particular, the seed bills and, and such like, there's a lot of uh, support still there and available. And, uh, you know, obviously, if you have a look on the website, you'll get more information or, in fact, contact any one of us and we'll, we'll help you where we can. Exactly. And we've had a good turnout in terms of uh, some of the webinars that we've done, which uh, explained the support that was out there and how we would be able to assist. But not only us, professionals, your accountants, your bankers, your lawyers, businesses should be seeking help from them. Because when you're in this kind of situation, sometimes it can become overwhelming. You're running, business, running a business itself is challenging. Faced with something like this, then you, any support, any help, any guidance, go for it. I mean, it, it, the cost benefits are there. You should look out, reach out, and uh, get the support that is out there and uh, utilize that to change direction, whatever's needed. And last and foremost, understanding your customers, aligning with the challenges that they're facing. If you can do that, then that will help you in terms of damage limitation, the initial stage, the survival stage. Next I agree. Slide. We're all in it together. In fact, we're all experiencing the same thing. It doesn't matter whether you're accountants, you're, you know, you've got a restaurant, you're a pharmacist, whatever you might be, we're all in this, this, uh, this thing together. Exactly. And uh, I mean, the large businesses, small businesses, in terms of short-term survival um, damage limitation actions, you would have heard T.M. Lewin to close all T.M. and Lewin, T.M. Lewin, sorry, uh, shirt makers, most people would know them, um, to close all 66 UK shops. They're going completely online. And that's as a result of what we've just faced. So once you've managed the initial, i.e. the short term, business is okay, you are, you're surviving, then you always have to look to the future because we're, we're in business to grow, we're in business to obviously make the business work. So then you have to strategically align to long-term market conditions. Moreover, you have to align the business with the trends that the new, this, the new phenomen, phenomenon has created. We at the moment do not know yet what the end trend's gonna be. Remote working, short supply chains, social distancing, consumers are a lot more, um, you know, a lot more smarter in terms of what they buy and enhanced use of technology. We don't know what the end game is. Are we going to remote work completely? I think there's going to be hybrid, short, shorter supply chains. They're getting back to normal now because social distancing is uh, eased off um, world over. Social distancing, I, I think, is here to stay because of uh, until a vaccine is found. So for this particular uh, situation that we're in, we do not know the end game, but we know more or less uh, the impact, certain impact uh, situations that we will be facing and therefore we can take certain actions. So turning some of the actions that we can take, some of the uh, pivots that we can take are turning one feature of a product into a product itself resulting in a simpler, more streamlined offering. 
What do I mean by that? Restaurants, for instance. Once again, you'll understand the audience here should understand rest restaurants turning into takeaways, training and learning businesses, having adopted their business models to allow for more online learning. And Ant here is going to be, well, he's right place at the right time. He'll be speaking about uh, his particular business model, I'm sure, later on. Listening to your customers, finding out how they use their product, um, what's missing. Sorry, let me get my thought in gear. Um, listening to your customers, finding out how they use their product, what's missing, what features they want. I'm reading here. Your customers could be using your product in a way that you never thought of before. Key thing, yeah, we sell, we buy and sell services. Do we exactly know how our customers are using what we are selling to them? It is key. Um, understanding that, if you can understand that, you're going to have a good business. Unilever, we know Unilever, global brand name, they've got thousands of products. What they've done is they've pivoted to prioritize their packaged food, surface cleaner, and personal hygiene brands over the other brands. And, and as I said, they've got thousands of brands. The reason they've uh, obviously pivoted to that is two. One, because there's a demand, huge demand for surface cleaners, packaged foods, and personal hygiene. But moreover, Brand loyalty. They're competing with the likes of Procter and Gamble. Brand loyalty is is massive for them. To to enable them to reposition to the to the consumers to show that they are doing things to help the consumer, giving them brand loyalty. Focusing on a different set of customers by positioning a company into a new market. Dyson is a casing example here. Dyson once again. Fantastic brand. We all use the vacuum cleaners here now. Uh, top of the range vacuum cleaners. Why would they need to change uh, or focus on a different set of customers? Once again, what they're trying to do, they're building ventilators. They started uh, building ventilators for the government. 10,000 already uh, built. They have a team of engineers around the clock um, making these. Why are they doing this? Once again, Consumers are holding brands and companies to a higher standard than previous, favoring those perceived to be doing more for society. Dyson seem to be doing more for healthcare. Once again, people will, um, you know, the name will stick to be, uh, people's minds, consumers' minds. So they are focusing on a different set of customers as a result of that. Changing a platform, say, from an app to a software. Technology is everywhere. We've seen so many examples, examples of that. Uh, won't go too much into that. Employing a new revenue model to monetize. A good example here is Airbnb. What's Airbnb's a business model? We all know. Connecting the host and the guest. Host being the hotel or the, the uh, house. Guest being us. Want to go, and go, go to a particular country. It connects it makes revenue, monetizes. However, travel has completely come to a standstill, i.e. their business model almost collapsing. So what, what have they done? They have moved from the traditional business model of connecting hosts and guests to almost become a full-time range, a, a lifestyle, a, a full-time lifestyle platform. So now what it allows is it allows hosts to offer online events, focusing on cooking, meditation, art therapy, virtual tours in different countries, and many other activities where users are able to join into these kind of activities for a small, modest fee. So they're changing their um, revenue model, not from uh, sort of commission agent flows to guests, a lifestyle platform. Lastly, using different technology to automate, stock management, bookkeeping entries, Shopify, classic example. Shopify found uh, a gap in the market for, so I was talking about um, stock uh, supply chain. Supply chain diminished because you couldn't get goods from A to B. Farmers therefore could not sell their product, couldn't get their product into the shelves of uh, supermarkets. Once again, farmers 
going out of business, losing money. What they did, they went onto the Shopify platform. So instead of going business to business, business directly to consumers. So farmers able to sell to household people like you and I using Shopify and where Shopify was smart, they integrated, not only gave them the platform to sell to consumers, but they gave them a platform with technology, which allow, allowed them to look at their stock, look at their sales, allow them to invoice, pay their suppliers, the whole shebang. So all the, the, uh, the, the particular, the end, the end supplier had to do was focus on their business, the farmer, their products, putting it to us using the platform that Shopify has now created for them. So once again, using different technology to automate new ideas, innovative, innovative is the, the buzzword when you come to strategic thinking in terms of how you would evolve your business as a result of conditions that are, that are affecting you. Next slide, please. Now, to finish off, I'm going to get back to once again, looking at your immediate needs, immediate uh, focus, and making sure that you are keeping that side in gear. Because once you take care of that, then the innovative, strategic, long term will come. When we talk to our clientele, most of them say, yeah, we know how well we're doing. We've got gut feel. I know how, how I'm running my, my business. I deliver a service. I'm really busy. I can look at my bank statement. It gives me everything I need to know. Potentially, yes. But there is a lot more out there, which if the entrepreneurs take advantage of, gives them a lot of data, a lot of knowledge that they can gain from looking at not just the gut feel and delivering a service. Look at your financial data. I'm not sure how many, I mean, all big businesses that I've been involved with, they want real time data, real time. So from the month closing, working day five, results which are out to the uh, board members, they want them almost working day one. The faster the information that you can have real time, on your business will give you um, advantage over your competitors in terms of what you need to do to, uh, to be that step ahead. Do you know your cash flow position month on month? Are you paying your customers to contract terms? Can you get the best negotiated terms with your suppliers? Are your margins the same as last year? Are you selling, yeah. Your gross profit, net profit, are they better than last year? Same as last year. Do you have a forecast? How, how good are you doing against your forecast? How good are you doing against your budget? All businesses should be doing that. And there is technology out there which enables you to do that more or less real time. So a lot of our clients are on zero and we encourage them to use the information that we are providing on it not necessarily using our services in, at all. They can log into the system and their dashboard and reports that they can get, which gives them all this kind of information. And moreover, there are tools that are available, technology available, which sits on top of the finance system, which gives you almost real-time um, information, not only on your finances, but on your organization, on your supply chain, on your... Uh, you know, a wide range. If I can show you the next slide. So we have a, uh, a platform that we um, use for some of our customers, which sits on top of the finance system, which will give you information real time. Obviously, there's an input from your side, which will give you real time information on your money, your sales, your teams, your systems, your, 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 your marketing, all these factors which you can see here summarized and it'll give you okay, good, poor, and you can then pinpoint in those areas which requires your attention to ensure that you are taking the right um, change of course, may not, not the right, uh, you're making the right changes, you're making the right decisions to then get your business to where it should be. So there are products out there and uh, 
business pivoting is all about understanding your business, understanding your external and internal factors affecting your business, having a feel of that and making decisions to make sure that you are a step ahead of your competition. I think this, this particular dashboard that you're looking at here is, I think it's fantastic. And it's a, it's a real early indicator of, uh, or it provides an early indication of the business's need to possibly change direction or to reinforce the direction it's going in. So, I mean, there could be areas there where, you know, uh, yeah, the money side isn't great, but possibly that's just because there hasn't been enough focus on debt management, for example, or whatever it might be. But, you know, equally, there could be a, you might have 10 products and only one of them are selling. So again, early indications of that as well uh, can come from this sort of tool. So I think it's, it's, it's a great product we're going to be uh, running pilots on for a number of our clients over the coming months. So if exactly. you're up for being on the pilot, then do, do let us know. So uh, audience, ladies, gentlemen, Tariq, uh, thank you um, for this, uh, allowing me to present here like this. First time I've done it must tell you webinar talking to this this feels like uh, playing football without any fans around you so I've done presentations where you can look eyeball people but here you know I can't see anybody I can't talk to them I'm just talking at a screen something new for me but now I'm going to pass as I said this this is uh, I was asked to come and do this um, I always said I was going to be the support act I'm passing you to the main act now Anthony Price Thanks, Rashmi. What, what a warm-up act it was as well, my friend. Um, excellent. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tarek Rashmi, um, for inviting me today. Um, I'm Anthony Price. Um, so, as Tarek and Rashmi have alluded to, um, I am in the process of founding a startup, which actually is a result of a need to pivot the business model in which I've always worked within in some shape or form. So about to launch a digital learning company, um, very much born out of the challenge um, of the fact that unfortunately, face-to-face -face learning, I think for the foreseeable future is gonna be a thing of the past. And as Rashmi says, the challenge we all have today is communicating to an audience without being able to look them in the eye. Uh, and of course that presents its own challenges. Um, but I wanted to start just briefly talking about the perfect storm we probably find ourselves in just for a moment or two. Um, I think if we were talking about pivoting a year ago, because as Rashmi alluded to, um, pivoting is an ongoing need really to evaluate the needs of the business. But of course, a year ago, we would have probably talked about automation being the big challenge, the fourth industrial revolution, I think as EY put it in a report once upon a time, um, to change our organization to suit the needs of the changing landscape outside. And of course, that's, that's part one. Part two is, of course, ways of working that's been, that's been mentioned already. There is a massive change in the habits of employees going to work. And actually, I think what COVID-19 has done is amplified and accelerated this change quite rapidly. Um, if you'd have said to me a year ago that 75% of a workforce would work successfully remotely, I would have probably questioned your sanity, but here we are. And I think all of us today, all of the hosts are indeed working from home today and technology, touch wood, um, aside, we should have a, a good interactive session. But this perfect storm, of course, with COVID-19 now, is as is, has been alluded to, is forcing us to think very radically about the immediate needs of our businesses' survival. And what a great dashboard that Tarek and Rashmi shared a bit earlier on. So for the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna kind of focus in on three main things. I'm gonna take a few minutes looking at some example brands that you and I will all be very familiar with and where they have successfully pivoted and others have unsuccessfully pivoted or worse still done nothing. And that is obviously the risk. We become debilitated by fear, uncertainty is rife and it prevents us from making those pivoting decisions. Then I'm gonna talk a bit about VUCA. I won't um, expand on that acronym until a bit later on. And then finally, what I thought would be really useful for you is just to spend five minutes talking about what's called the Cotter model. And if you are thinking about pivoting your business, um, there are six components that I'd recommend you take away and build your change plan around. And what I mean by that is, 
without certain pillars of planning and knowledge and experience in your pivoting project team, there is a risk that change is unsuccessful and you'll be able to see what happens when we remove certain elements or certain pillars um, of that cotton model, what the risk is when the change does eventually happen. So those are the three things I'm gonna talk about today. So next slide, please. Um, using the chat box, I would love, at the bottom of the toolbar, you should see there's a chat box. Type yes or no if you, well, no, type how many of these logos you recognize. I'm hoping um, you recognize all seven of them. Um, and but not being an accountant, I'm pretty confident that there are seven there, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm interested to see how many of these brands you recognize. Let me just open up this box then. All of them, all of them, lots of people commenting on all of them, which is good news. Um, so the reason I brought these logos up is, as you can probably allude to, we're in a situation where some of these brands have successfully pivoted. Um, and of course, these are big brands. And let me talk briefly about each of them and why I chose them today. Um, let's start top right, Heart. Um, big brands um, and actually a brand that I'm passionate about because my career started in commercial radio. But 20 years ago, the internet was just about becoming a thing. It was dial up, internet was slow. And of course, what the internet has done is not only really killed well, video killed the radio star, but I think internet then gave them an additional challenge. Why would I listen to a radio station with the same 30 songs on repeat when I can have my, my device or my internet connection can allow me to access millions of songs in my favorite 150 songs? No longer are cassette tapes and CD players a thing in the car anymore. And equally, their revenue model advertises traditionally back in the day had a choice of radio, advertising, newspaper, yellow pages. Now we have Google Pay Per Click and other things. Heart have successfully reinvented their business to be very much a digital thing. So they're massive on apps now. They're massive on generating revenue through other means, not just on air and airtime campaigns. And they work with a lot of entertainment businesses and they do events and other bits and pieces as well. Uh, Global Heart's parent company, incidentally, have recently bought out one of the major outdoor um, advertising platforms, you know, the billboards, um, they bought um, Exterion, I think is the company that used to be going a lot of the underground stations in London, for example, to create this blended advertiser experience. They've also consolidated their business very heavily. Without those changes, um, the stations and brands in the UK radio industry that have not pivoted have failed. Um, I, I can talk from personal experience of working in stations where they relied on exclusive airtime adverts to make their money. And guess what? They've, they've now disappeared. Now, next one I'm going to talk about is Shell. Shell for me is an interesting one because we all recognize that logo. We probably pull into a, a petrol station on a frequent basis. But I'm not sure if any of you are aware, but about 130 years ago, Shell were famous for selling shells. They had a stock a shop, sorry, in London, and they sold shells that were imported from all over the world and they were purchased and displayed in people's homes uh, as ornaments. Um, and the pivot in their business was this recognition that actually there is gonna come a time where shells are no longer, you know, these exotic shells are no longer the, the fashionable thing. But one thing that they did know about was importing. And they used to hire space on container ships bringing in these shells from around the world. And when the motor car arrived, they recognized actually we could use that space in the container ships instead of importing shells to import oil. And the rest, as you can appreciate, is history. Um, Argos, for me, I was talking to Rashmi and Tarek about this in a, in a briefing, in a, in a brief call we had a few weeks ago. And for me, Argos have pivoted, I guess, to a point. They're, they're moving away from a printed catalog to digital products. But actually, for me, I think they should have been Amazon. I really do. Um, actually, as a business, they already had no real shop front. They didn't, you didn't go in and look at the items in Argos. You'd walk in, there was a sea of catalogs. You checked your stock and you, you got the item out of the warehouse. Had they have delivered to door sooner? Had they have perhaps been thinking about doing, they, uh, they recently started uh, holding items of eBay so you can, get, you can pick up from a local Argos store. But all of this thing has come too late and a lot is in the timing. Next, Netflix. Netflix is an interesting one. 
Blockbuster, that famous video rental store brand, had the opportunity to buy Netflix and refused to buy it when Blockbuster were the predominant player. And guess what? Here we are today and Netflix now in theory could have gobbled up Blockbuster in a huge way. Now, Netflix have successfully pivoted twice. Um, Netflix, as many of you may recall, was originally a mail order DVD rental firm. The reason Blockbuster didn't acquire them is they felt, why should someone wait for three days to receive a disc, a video or a DVD in the post when I can go to my local Blockbuster and, and pick it up instantly? But of course, then when the internet became a thing, they then went to streaming and that's where Blockbuster's revenues plummeted. And as internet connections got more stable, that business model shifted and Blockbuster were left as we all now know it as a non-existent entity. But what Netflix have also now done though, has become very clever at not just being a reseller of others' content. So in the last five years, we all now know that they have lots of Netflix exclusives. They now create the content and now they're acquiring new users not to access the millions of things that they license on behalf of the license holders, but they now have their own content because the risk would have been had they have just stayed static, that all they would have become famous for is the greatest hits of everybody else's work. And actually once I've uh, binge watched all of those box series, then actually I'm not using it as much and I'll turn it off. So they now had to get clever at innovating themselves again. Again, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet. Kodak have gone into medical. Nokia, yes or no in the chat box. Um, who had a Nokia phone 15 years ago? I certainly did. Um, Nokia, um, for me, is a shame because I think we would have all agreed 15 years ago, Nokia was the Apple of today. They were the absolute owner of phones. You and I had a mobile phone. If we didn't have a Nokia, well, we probably had something that broken and the, the, the Motorola Razor or the Blackberry, but Nokia was the phone to have. Where they let themselves down and not pivoting, as has been talked about regularly in articles since, is Apple allowed developers to enter into their ecosystem to create apps. Nokia had their own ecosystem. Snake was about the excitement of our functionality of our app gaming, if you will. In the meantime, there was this PDA device, which I have one here, which has innovated even more since, that allowed developers to put content on their platform to mean that you and I could access anything and everything. And of course, TomTom sat-navs have all been swallowed up by a smartphone. And Nokia, unfortunately, these days, I believe now rely on Android as an operating system. Final example for me, Yellow Pages. Yellow Pages were FTSE 100, FTSE 250, darling of the early noughties. And here we are today as a non-existent entity. Um, they have a very small number of staff um, and actually they didn't create their own product. They innovated only with print because they were too reliant on that revenue, despite the fact that our usage was going onto the internet and now more recently smartphones. And Google were, are now the yellow pages, but they were able to scale. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of where I think about these things. But as Tarek and, and Rashni said earlier on, as small business owners, as medium-sized enterprises, what is it that we do now that now needs to change to serve the business in the future? Put COVID aside, uh, put the thinking about your consumers, what has changed? And as Tarek and Rashmi have alluded to, my challenge as running a learning company would, is now, of course, the willingness of employees to come together in one place to spend time face to face with me and with each other when they all work in different offices around the world or around the country is dead. And I think it will be for some time. Fortunately, technology has allowed us this wonderful technology. I think Zoom is a, is a huge innovation and has allowed consumers to access it much more readily. But equally, without that technology, L&D businesses that don't pivot to be more virtual, more digital, are not going to survive. And of course, with that also becomes scale. You know, I can only be a person in a room with 20 people. Now I can be on a webinar with 300 people. So there is an awful lot of opportunity that I think exists in the digital space, but I'm very aware for you on this webinar today, your needs might be a bit different. So next slide, please. Um, I wanted to talk quickly about VUCA. Um, and by the way, if you wanna get yourself, 
I would say some light reading. This is quite a meaty book. It's a book called Relax, It's Only Uncertainty. And for me, this is a great book because, and actually this was written ironically in 2000. Um, so this was when the digital world was coming alive and business owners were still living in denial and maybe suffering slightly from the dot-com bubble boom. Um, but there was a recognition that if I don't adapt and change, I'm not going to survive. Um, and of course, in a CEO, a managing director's mind, or even a people leader, that creates a huge amount of uncertainty in our heads about where we're going to go. And there is a massive risk here, ladies and gents, of us focusing exclusively on the needs of the business and forgetting about the people. And for me, there are two things that we, you know, we, we've talked about the business so far, and we're going to talk about a process in a little bit. But for me, I, I would really recommend if you take some time, even if you read a summary of this book, it talks about the importance of the business and the interest of your people. Now, you may have to make some tough decisions, but those ones you want to retain as a leader right now, they're looking for you to create that certainty. It's your and I job as people managers and managing directors of businesses to create a vision that's exciting. We don't want to sit here and say, oh, COVID's going to kill us. That's it, we're doomed. Um, it may well be the case, but of course, a leader needs to bring their people with them onto that rough journey. And it's your job as a leader to really create conditions of certainty around the chaos. So VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. I'll repeat that again in case any of you are furiously writing it down. So volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And I would really encourage each of you on the webinar today to perhaps write those words down and give yourself in your mind a score out of 10, add some extra elements to Rashmi and Tarek's dashboard about where you rate the levels of volatility in your business and your business model right now on a scale of one to 10. And where would you like it to be and how do you think you could reduce that volatility down? Uncertainty, maybe that's here to stay. And actually I would argue uncertainty has always been the case, but maybe it's more internalized for all of us right now. But how can we reduce uncertainty for our people? What number is it now as how you present yourself as a leader? And how do you think you can communicate something exciting that reduces those levels of uncertainty for your people? As I said, I'm very aware for some of you, you may need to make some tough decisions in terms of keeping resources or letting some go. But the ones you want to keep, if you don't create that certainty, there will either be survivor guilt or worse still, those people will not believe in the certainty that you're creating for them and may leave voluntarily. And then of course, that creates an even bigger storm. Complexity, hey, uh, I think as, as Tarek um, and Rashmi have already alluded to, there's some great schemes out there. Uh, and equally, the governments around the world are really struggling to try and create simplified ways of supporting businesses. But internally, what can you do to reduce the complexity for your organization? And finally, the ambiguity. You know, again, we've, we've kind of touched on all of those things already. So for me, two things from, from, from this before I move on to the next slide. Really think about the needs of your business and also think about the needs of your people. How are you going to retain those people successfully during this period of uncertainty? So finally, if we go on to the next slide, I want to introduce you to the Cotter model. Um, and this will animate as I talk it through it. We should do it all by itself. There we go. It's going nicely. But if you are thinking about creating change or a pivot within your business, arguably, for me, the Cotter model is a really simple six pillar approach for creating successful change. And if you're thinking about creating a pivot or a change in your business, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the first thing to think about is a vision, a vision you can rally your people around. This is what we want to do, guys. Uh, and we want you to be excited about it. We recognize the world has changed. How can we do this together? And, you know, obviously um, creating a vision sometimes is a challenge right now. But what is the certainty you can create? And that's where you create your vision. Secondly, on the skills. Um, obviously, um, the competencies of your workforce may need to change. 
Uh, I can tell you, Rashmi, Tarek and myself are still learning all this webinar technology. How many of you now are having to work remotely? How skillful are your dinosaur employees who used to like working on a pen and paper? Email is no longer the single communication tool because for some of them, it may be the only way they want to communicate. Equally, if you are looking to offer different services, what skills are missing? Give yourself a reality check of what things are there. Think about the incentives. Now for the incentives, for me, that doesn't just mean offering increase of pay or bonus schemes. Sometimes the incentives can be certainty. Sometimes the incentives can be, we can reduce cutting costs or cutting headcount. Think about those incentives and think about how you campaign those incentives in your business. The resources, are the right people in the right roles? This is slightly different to skills. Um, are there new people you need to bring in? Um, are there suppliers? Are there training providers that can help you equip to be ready for this new normal? Uh, look, this one leadership for me is probably, and, and, and Tarek and Rashmi will beat me up for saying it, this one for me is always a massively important one, possibly the most important one, because with a great leader, people will want to rally around that leader to deliver the change. So think about how you inspire your people, create that vision and be a campaigner of that vision. And finally, the obvious one is the plan. But what a great six pillar thing to really start building your plan about. Think about your timelines. Think about specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound. How time bound and what timeline are you working to? Use the dashboard that Rashmi and Tarek were talking about. And for me, that is a great way of creating successful change. But if we move on to the next slide, I would love you to reflect for a moment about the need to change something in your business. So think about something and you can, there we go, think of a product launch. Uh, and ask yourself these questions. And I'm not going to go through these questions because I'm conscious of time and there's an opportunity for Q&A. But think about that. I've talked about it on the previous slide, but this is a great set of questions to ask yourself and your management team. If we are going to create change here, if we're going to pivot our business, what do we need to do? And here are some great starting questions. But where the cotton model for me comes to life, if we move on to the next slide, is I want to show you what happens if you don't put all of your components into this mix. If we take away one of those six pillars, what would happen? So if we keep animating this slide now, you'll see that if we remove leadership, it may create confusion. If we remove the skills, it's gonna create anxiety. If we're gonna have no plan, we're gonna be a lot later getting this project to market. Uh, we're gonna have false starts, mistakes, if we're going to lack the resources, there's going to be frustration that I'm overwhelmed. I can't cope with all this change on my own. I need the right support. I need the right people and the right jobs to make it happen. And finally, lack of incentives will slow things down. And I don't know about you, there's a risk of cost of doing nothing rather than a value of doing something. So for me, the Cotter model is a really simple set of six pillars that would allow you to think logically about how you could pivot your business. And actually, if you were working with a management team in the next few weeks about pivoting your business, perhaps align each one of your management team with one or two of these pillars to think about being the cheerleader of for your organization. And if you do that, I think you then create the accountability to create the change in a successful way. And your role as a leader of that committee is to oversee the contributions each of those people are making. Now, the John Cotter is, um, there's, there's an awful lot of, of, of information out there on Cotter. Stick his name into a search engine of your choice or go through the yellow pages if you're still old hat and find Cotter model training. Um, but actually, for me, there is a real nice piece in this, which I think is relatively applicable to all of you today. Um, so there we go. Um, hopefully that was of use for you. I've talked about three things. I've talked about um, successful businesses and unsuccessful businesses pivoting. I've talked about uncertainty, VUCA, and I've talked to you about the Cotton Model. And I really hope that um, as I look to launch Try Digital, which hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk about another time, and maybe you can join me and find out more about that if the opportunity arises. But Cotton Model for me is going to be something that's integral to building the business 
uh, as we do over the coming months and years. Um, thank you very much, Rashmi and Tarek. Back to you guys. I see. That was excellent. I was completely intrigued by that, as I'm sure uh, the audience were. I have a question for you, though. Um, so come back. <laughs> okay. um, incentives. So what are the right incentives in, in a climate like this where, you know, generally speaking across the UK, we're looking at uh, significant redundancies. I, I was going to say mass redundancies. Significant redundancies. Um, you know, you're letting people go. Uh, they may already be on their way out the door. Um, and at that time, you're trying to pivot the business in another direction, get everybody fired up with these these new uh, ideas. Uh, how do you how do you incentive how, you know, that survival thing? You know, that guilt, all of that. So, how do you get it right? Um, so that, that, that's a really interesting one, and we talk about this quite a lot in some of the leadership work I've done over the last eighteen months. And a few, and there's, there's an awful lot of non-monetary incentives that you and I as leaders can do with our employees. And it can be as simple as, for example, on a Friday morning, I have in my calendar a recurring event that says rule of recognition. And every Friday morning, I make a point of emailing one of my direct reports or someone in the wider business to thank them or congratulate them on some work well done. And that can have a massive impact. When you've got a remote workforce, they're really hungry for recognition, feeling valued, feeling part of it. And as you say, Tarek, I think there is a massive recognition at the minute that actually as a business, employees aren't expecting any financial recognition right now because it's, it's survival mode. But actually there are a number of things you can do that are low cost. Having um, virtual coffee breaks where you actually just check in with your people, have yeah. conversations with them about how they're doing outside of work. Um, there are free webinars out there. For example, this one where you can offer people you know, actually, do you know what? While you're working from home, why don't you, you know, work more flexibly? Why don't you have some time back? Actually, if you get your work done at three in the afternoon and you want to go to the park, go to the park. That, as a leader, if you've not done that before, can have a massive payload for your employees. Um, for example, you know, I've, I'm, I'm currently in the process of leaving my large corporate role. And for the last two years, we've had no financial incentives within my budget whatsoever. And yet I've had a low retention, but we've had a real push on non-monetary recognition. So think about um, you know, inviting people to roundtable discussions. Think about that rule of recognition um, and think about giving people you know, flexible time off. Those sorts of things, I would say, are great incentives for people to feel engaged and recognized for the work they're doing. I hope that's of use, Tarek. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Thank really you. good, thank um, you. I've got a question here from uh, Michael, uh, which uh, again, I think, and uh, I think you'd be able to help with. Um, so the question is, is it better to plan the pivot with a dedicated team or as part of the whole workforce? I'm now going to give a politician's answer. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, you know what, it's, it's, I think the more stakeholders you can bring in, the better. Uh, however, there is the, the old adage of too many cooks can spoil the broth. I, I, I certainly think if you can identify some, certainly the people you want to retain engaged within your organization, those are the ones I would want to be giving additional responsibility to. There are always risks of, of giving everybody some responsibility and guess what? They then blame their underperformance for their day job because of this new project you've given them. Um, so I would be careful in the selection, but certainly for me, communication is key. So I would say if you're gonna go through a pivot, I would certainly be offering regular virtual town halls um, to give updates on where things are at and involve those stakeholders um, to those, those six pillar people to communicate how things are going where that's concerned. But don't, don't, don't um, hold back on encouraging you know, some of the delegation within your, your committee's teams to others in the business. I would just say make sure there's a fair line of communication up and you kind of limit that, that, that committee audience. Um, it, it would be my, my guidance. But again, I think it's subjective to the, to the needs of the business and the change you're going to make. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, another question from Michael. Uh, I think I'll take this one, uh, which is, are there any grants or release for new innovative processes and reskilling the workforce? So, uh, yeah, innovative processes uh, are indeed tax credit. So there's some very, very... Um, valuable release available um, that um, you can find out more information on our website in fact 
So if you go to uh, the tax area on our website, there is a, a little bit of information on the tax credit, but also uh, give us a call and we can help you through that as well. And of course, on reskilling the workforce, there's a number of schemes available, uh, made available by the government, at least the apprenticeship scheme. So I think that's something definitely worth having a look at. Okay. Um, any more questions? Remember, I can't see any popping up on my screen. Um, I think uh, we've, we've come to a close anyway in terms of timing. So um, uh, I think just a couple of things to wrap up on. Um, from what I've taken away from all of this, and I've learned a lot, um, you know, particularly from Ant, um, who's, you know, provided an incredibly valuable uh, contribution to this webinar this morning. Um, so for me, yeah, make sure you do the analysis um, on your business and you keep that live and current, um, both financial and otherwise. Uh, what's your BRUCA score? Uh, that's something I've learned today. I'm going to try to remember that acronym. Um, so uh, that's very, very important. Uh, make sure you're buying from the people around you, both at work and personal. So in the, I'm, as a role that I have within McAlvin's as a leader and uh, Rashmi as well, I think it's really, really important for us that we are buying from the people around us. Uh, the last thing you, know, you need is negativity. That said, you need to be open to new ideas and, uh, and substantiated critique as well. So uh, I think having a blinkered uh, view on things is, is not good either. So uh, that's important. And above all, work fast, commit wholeheartedly uh, to your pivot, but always be prepared to re-pivot. Um, you know, you might make the wrong decision. And so don't be, uh, don't just run down that path and find uh, the long, you know, once you're a long way down it, that it's a, it's a long way back. Be prepared to, to change uh, the pivot that you're on with, with the times. Uh, so thank you everybody for attending and uh, especially my panelists, Rashmi, and Ant, who is our guest uh, panelist today. And we look forward to seeing you and hearing from you uh, very, very soon. Uh, you can reach both Rashmi and I at McAlvin's. Our uh, telephone number's there. It's Tarek at McAlvin's.com or Rashmi at McAlvin's.com. Please reach out to your client uh, directors who can help you with any of the topics that we discussed today or anything else you need help with. And if anybody wants to get in touch with Ant uh, through Thai Jigsaw, Again, drop me a line, I will provide further details. We do plan to have Ant back at some point in the future uh, to talk a little bit more about his new venture. So thank you once again. <laughs>